Hi, uh, Sarah, on behalf of the IMRIC team, I'd like to introduce Paula Clough and on to present on inspired uses of the quiz and database module modules. Uh, also like to thank Big Blue Button for hosting. Uh, thank you, Paula. Away you go. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Hello, everybody. My name is Paula Clo, and I am actually a retired teacher. Um, I couldn't get enough of Moodle, so I went back to work at Clark University as an e-learning support specialist so I could work with Moodle some more. Um, I work with um, students and teachers on using Moodle and all the other technology that we have available too. Uh, Clark University is a small private university in Dubuque, Iowa in the U.S. You can contact me through Moodle.org or my email address and my Twitter is there. I also do some volunteer work from freemoodle.org. So if you haven't checked that out, you ought to go check that out too. Um, excuse my PowerPoint. Some of the, some of the alignments and stuff, things are going to be off because yesterday we were having a hard time seeing some of my pictures and things, so I went ahead, instead of using the PDF, actually put in a PowerPoint, and there's a few places where things are a little bit off. I also do something I never do and um, really increase the size of some of my pictures, and they kind of run in under my text, but I think it'll make it easier for you to see that. This is the first time. This, this weekend is the first time that I've presented online, so I'm just using my PowerPoint. I'm not trying to do the screen sharing and things like that. i am decided that this is just enough. And um, so if also when we finish on my course page, there's the forum for questions and ideas. If you want to post some other ideas that you have, we're using the databases and the quizzes, that would be great. Or if you have any questions that we don't get a chance to answer. Also, there's a place that I've down, uh, you can download the database presets and the XML questions. There's also a formatting tables book that I created that'll explain a lot about how to format tables to use them in your databases and in your quizzes. Now, this is changing as we change on to a new um, editing window in Moodle. This one will work with a, the tiny MC. Thanks, Stuart. And also, there's a copy of this PowerPoint and the PDF version, too, if that's easier for you to download. One other thing that's in there, some people yesterday asked me for a look at some of the databases and the quizzes. I do have a site that I use just for creating content and reviewing courses that are uh, shared online. It's kind of a real low bandwidth, so there is a page on there with some uh, logins that you can use to get in there and look at some of them, but please be real kind. Um, don't do them right away today. Give it give it a little while so we don't have a hundred people in there all at once. Uh, the people that let me use the site might not be really happy with me if you do that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get started. I just wanted to say also yesterday some of the places that I will be mentioning is uh, on the Mount Orange School demo site on Moodle.net. There's an activity examples course that also has some databases and quizzes and some other things in it that was taken directly out of the old Moodle exchange, which is where we used to be able to post uh, databases and glossaries and things like that to share with other people. And that has changed into Moodle.net. Um, but that course is there, and they're set up so that you can take a look at them. Most of them have samples in them as well. Also, the Moodle recipes, I pulled some of these creative ideas out of there. And there's links here in the PowerPoint, but also uh, the links are on the course page. And we'll 
Moodle.net. Uh, I love Moodle.net. I love the old Moodle Exchange. Um, it's a great place to learn about Moodle. That's how I learned about databases. They were very confusing to me at first, and when I was able to get the presets and set them up and go in and look at how people actually did things was the easiest way for me to be able to really learn how these things happen. So that's one of the reasons I love to share, and I hope that some of you guys will start sharing with us too. And um, I used to help out on the Moodle Exchange for a couple of years, and Mary L also helped out there too. And so some of the, the things that you see will be from her as well. Don't forget to go to check out freemoodle.org. That's my little advertisement there. OK. Today, what I want to do is to get you in the habit of seeing more uses for Moodle modules. Uh, the quiz and the database specifically today, but also to start thinking about the other modules that are in Moodle. Also, I want to show you that even though I know databases are more work than a lot of the modules in Moodle, that I really think that they are worth the extra work. And I think you'll agree with me when, we do, when we're done. Also, I want to get you sharing too, if you have some databases or quizzes or glossary entries or even a course that you'd like to share. We hope that you'll share too. I'm going to switch it around. I was going to talk about quizzes first, but I'm going to talk about the databases first since those are the ones that kind of intimidate people. How many of you, would you raise your hand if it's, if it's there where you can see it and let me know if you've ever built a database module for learning in Moodle? There we go. There's some hands coming up. Oh, yeah, I, I know some names there. I'm sure that you've done quite a few. OK. Thank you. But a, a lot of you haven't. Yeah, it is a little clunky. It seems a little clunky to get started. You're, you're absolutely right. And it is kind of intimidating for a lot of people. Part of it is is a lot of the databases, or the, a lot of the modules, excuse me, in Moodle, you just create the activity page and you're almost ready to go. <laughs> and so, but in database, not only do you have to create the activity page, then you have to create the fields. There are templates in there that will control how the different uh, screens are showing up, but if you want to, you can go in and, and edit them. You're right, it is confusing until you realize how, how easy it really is, and also how flexible it is. That's the one thing that really sold me on databases, is I could choose what it is I wanted in there. I didn't have to go by a preset format like I do with the glossaries. I love the glossaries too, but I like being able to, to choose if I want more than one file or two or three pictures or whatever it is that I need to have in there. Also, I like that I can change the layout screens. Those are called the templates of the, of the list view and the single view and how to add the entries so that I can make it something that not only is appealing in the way it looks, but also makes it easier for the learners and for myself. I can also very easily choose whether it's private between the student and myself as an instructor, or whether it's not, if it's something that everybody can share the information in. I like that flexibility now, but I have to agree with some of you, when I first started using it, it was kind of scary. But even though it's more work, I think when you look at some of the things that we can do with it, you might want to try it because I really think it's worth the time. One of the things that databases can do is make life easier for our instructor. This one, this was in the old Moodle exchange, and it was collecting quiz test questions. And what it did is allow the teacher to have the students create questions for a quiz or a test. And it also had the, the standards or the performance objectives 
that were in this unit so that the students could match up what the question was asking with what it was that they were supposed to be learning about. I, I think that's a great way of making students really think deeper about things. Um, this is the default template for the list view, and it's very, very simple. It just has um, the field names down here and then the information that was entered in the entry over here on this side. This one has two entries in it, one up here and one down here. Another thing is an individual student repository, a place for students to put their files. Now, this was idea was suggested before we had the nice private file entry, but I think it's still something that teachers might want to use because sometimes you have students working on things and you want to make sure that they're actually making progress by having a database where they upload their files when they're working on them the teacher can make sure that the students are actually making progress towards their goal. Um, there's a, the way to uh, have privacy on something like this is to turn approval on in the database and then just don't approve it. As long as you don't approve it, the only people who can see it are the student and the instructor. Another way of doing it is to use separate groups and have one student in each group. Again, the only people who can see it are the student and the instructor. Forms. Oh man, as a teacher there's so many forms that we want sometimes and that we have to have. Um, one of the things is sometimes we'll, uh, at the beginning of the year when I taught uh, fourth grade, I had a little interest form that I sent out and had the students fill out so I could kind of get in to know them a little bit and things like that. With a database, I could have that form right online. The students could make it out and I would be able to search through it any time I wanted. And even the students could search through it and look and see who had interests similar to theirs. A wonderful tool and it's usable for many, many kinds of forms. Administrators can use it uh, for keeping their student referrals on, when, behavior referrals when they're having problems with students. And the, the, all the information can be downloaded into Excel, so then you can do some statistical analysis as well. There's so many things that you could do with this and not have to keep that stack of papers all organized and have to shuffle through it when you're trying to do things. Um, I worked in some rural school districts where, yes, it, there might be some nice software out there that would do these things for, for people, but we didn't always have the money for that nice piece of software. So this was a way that people could keep track of things without having to worry about it. This was the first one that I saw, and this was on the Moodle Exchange. This was the first one that I saw that had really done something interesting with those templates. And this is when I found out you could do that. <laughs> so it was really interesting to me. Uh, this actually is uh, the single view, and the instructor would project this up on the board in the classroom. And I'm going to scroll in just a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. And it gave the information of what the objective was for the day, what the journal prompt was so students could sit down and get busy, and what they needed in class. Also, it's hard to read, you can't see it, but down here at the bottom is information to fill in if there's any students out that day. The instructor can fill it in and let the students know what they need to do in order to catch up in the class. That keeps it all together, easy to find for the students and the teachers themselves. back a little. Sorry. Okay, so that's a way that it can make life easier for the teachers and the students. Another thing that we can use databases for are the assignments and sharing. Now, I had to cut down many of my examples because this got way too long. It's still still kind of long, but you know, so I'm going to give some synopsis of some of the things, but 
This one is a research results database. Uh, students were in groups where they studied, each group studied a different biome, and then they would go into the database and put their information in. The nice thing about this, though, too, is that the um, entry itself became the teaching and presentation tool when they presented to the other students. So the other students would have this to look at on the screen. They didn't have to build a separate PowerPoint. They could talk about their biome. The, the changes in this is to get the nice colored background and get the font that's darker and larger. Those are all things that are right in the edit box as far as the font. The changes in color are right in the table properties. And in that formatting tables book, you'll find the directions on how to do those kind of things if you've never done them before. The nice thing about this is this also becomes a place that students can go in and look up things. It becomes a resource as well as a project. Yes. And it can even be shared with other classes. Some other ideas for sharing would be for, for instructors to have a class where they can go in and have a database where they have unit plans or lesson plans or share resources or even share their quiz or glossary entries or their ideas right there as well as presets for the databases and exports from the different things. Also for students, again, the, the research project could also be something that they've typed up in text and put into the database and then the other students excuse me can go in and look at it and give them feedback and comment on the content it can all again becomes a resource for research so that they can look things up course notes is another one you can have a student each day that posts the course notes into a database so that students who are absent can go in and look at them and see what it was that was covered that day This is a book review that was in the Moodle forums, and I love this. This is the list view right here, and this one, they've made it, instead of that, the tables setting out side by side, they've gone in and listed the information going horizontally. And this is, this is a really nice trick because when you click on the title, it takes you directly to the single entry. And you can see it that way. It even has the little star ratings that the students can give it. I'll show I also have a picture of the what the book entry itself looks like. And again, this is just this is just like working with tables in in Microsoft Office in a lot of ways. If you use the table properties and cell properties, you can change the background colors, you can merge cells together and make it look really nice and appealing, but also make it easy for students to see what it is. The other thing is, is it also becomes a resource so that students can uh, go back in and choose a book that they want to read as well after they've seen what their one of their peers says about it. This one, I'll tell you what, I really hadn't realized how powerful working with tables and a little bit of HTML can really be in a database. This particular one is a teacher who had students studying language and they had to identify conversational elements in YouTube videos. They identified the example and then they had to put it into the database and it has a, in the ad entry, it has a really nice picture here of exactly the part of the um, address that it needed and how to figure out the time in seconds so it could tell the program exactly where to start the YouTube video. Then when the view list comes up and the single list, it's embedded right in there and as soon as you start it, it'll take it a second or so and then it'll go forward to exactly where the sample started. I just thought that was awesome and it opened up a whole new world of possibilities to me. This is one 
that a teacher at our school did because he likes to have assignments done online and he had several assignments that were very, very similar and he wanted them all together so he could look at them and see what the different things were that, that students did. Up here at the top he has four different things that the students have to do. They check which one they're answering and then they enter the data here. The nice thing that I liked about what he did too was that he used this area over here to fill in the things that he had listed that they had to be sure that they included in this entry here. Now one of the things that's hard about doing databases with tables is that when you start putting that much text on this side, this will go over further and further and further until you've got this big column here and this little tiny column there. Well, all we had to do was go in and select the column, go into Delta properties and give it a width. And we selected 30%, or it's about 80 pixels, I think. But I like to use percentages because then when you're working on different size screens, it doesn't take over a screen again or make it so that it's really hard to read. But I really like the idea that he put the information there for the students so they didn't have to keep going out to another document and seeing what they were supposed to be doing. This coloring was all set right in table properties when the table was set up. And that book will tell you more about doing that. Here's another one. When we first went from 1.9 to 2, our uh, journal plugin wasn't working at the time. And so we set up databases for the teachers to use. And actually, we've gone on and used that since. This particular one, the instructor, same as instructors before, he wanted to have all of the journal entries together through the semester, so he set it up so that there's radio buttons for each week, and the students would select one, and then they come in over here and fill in their journal. We set it up for privacy, and he only rates the satisfactory or better entries and uses some of grades. So anything that's not satisfactory is a zero. This is the way that we did the privacy settings for this. We knew that they were only going to do 16 entries, so we made the required entry 16. And then the maximum that they can make was 16. So they cannot make more than 16. But then we set the entries for viewing up higher than that. Now, I, for this instructor, I set it clear to 50 because he likes to change things out. And I wanted to make sure he didn't accidentally just change it by a few and, and end up having it so that students were uh, seeing each other's entries. So we set it clear up to the top. But that worked out really slick to be able to do that. This is another teacher. This was for our Spanish class that wanted only one entry in a journal, but wanted a journal for every week. So again, we just set it up with one entry for completion, one for maximum, and 10 required before they could view. And this particular one, all we need here is the um, text area in the add entry, because then, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's those action commands when you're making the templates. in the list view and in the single view, we just use those action commands to put in the username and the time that it was posted and if it w the time it was modified, if it was modified. So that fits in there very slick and you don't have to have the students put in that information. Now that seems really complicated. The thing about it is though, is there is a way to make it easier. So that if I make that journal in one class, I can I can carry it over to other classes, not just mine, but other people can use it too. Um, that's called the presets. So we can use those to share the work and share the knowledge and what people are doing. Um, it, presets are very easy to export and import. There is one preset in core right now. It's called the image gallery. Also a system administrator can go ahead and set up some of the presets as part of the system, like this journal here. 
that a lot of the teachers like to use. We just have it set up as a preset. That contains all of those fields and those templates for you. So once you've set up the edit settings page, you go into the presets, click on that button and say choose. Um, and they're, they're, that shareability makes it so much easier. You can still do some editing though once you have that preset in there. If you need just one more field, you can put that more, one more field in there. Here's a example from the um, Moodle Recipes. And it is the image gallery preset. This was pictures from a field trip. And the students posted. And then in the caption, they had to put the observation. So if they were studying what animals eat, they could take a picture and then in the caption talk about what that animal eats. And the way that this view is just set up so nicely across here, um, like a little gallery, that's all part of the preset. You don't have to do anything to make that happen except put the preset in. And here's what a single view of that page looks like. Here's another idea from Little Recipes. This is using, again, that image gallery preset. So there's hardly anything to set it up. Put in the description. Set up the preset and you're ready to go. Um, this was one where it was a sign for the students to create a little poster about a topic that they were studying. And um, then they posted it to the database. She required the students to change it to 300 by 600 pixels. This is nice if you give them a size so that you don't have, uh, when you go to single view, these huge pictures that take up the whole page unless you want it to do that. Uh, she set up the permissions. She made sure that the students were able to rate and comment on them so that they could self-evaluate their own work and then evaluate the work of others. And this is a really nice place to put in custom scales. I don't know if all of you know that in the grades, section, if you go in there, there's scales listed in the, in the, Navi, um, excuse me, in the system or the administration block, depending on which version of Moodle you have. And you can go in there and create your own scales. Uh, some people like to have stars, like five stars, three stars, four stars. Other people like to use words like, like, don't like, whatever. Um, I think that's an awesome thing to do when you're having students talk to each other and comment on things and rate things, because it's, it's not the same as giving them an A, a B, or a C. Uh, and again, those also, if you get one that a lot of people want to use, talk to your administrator, and they can save them as system scales so that other people can pick them up and use them really easily. Now, the other thing about presets is that we can, because we can download them, we can save them and share them. Uh, we can use a database to do that with if we want to as well. This is one, another one that was on the Moodle Exchange. And uh, Mary Al set this one up. She has nice columns here that are colored so that you know where they are, but the entries themselves go horizontally across the screen. It's really, really nice. Um, and there is some information. In that book, um, a link to a Moodle News article on how to set up that view list so that the tables come across horizontally that I think you might really enjoy. She even has this nice little dashed um, uh, order around those that make it even nicer. But what this, the idea of this is to put it there so that people can share and download the presets. And that's what's in the Moodle course that goes with this so that you can go in there and download whatever you want to take away from this. There is also a zipped file that has all of them from the course in there. Um, not everything. There's a couple of quizzes that I don't have the questions for. I have, don't have permission to share those. But the, most everything else is in there. And some of these two I'll be sharing, the ones that are mine, I'll be sharing on Moodle.net. So you can download them from there, too. Well, I really think that quizzes are worth the extra work. I, I do know that it's 
not the easiest thing to figure out, but I think that they're, they're worth the extra work, and I hope that you will give it a try and have some fun with it. Next, I want to talk about the quizzes. I know at our institution, many of the teachers, really the only thing the quizzes get used for are those exams. Give a, We have a lot of teachers that give exams right on Moodle. And also, you know, after reading, they'll have some comprehension questions for the students to make sure that they really, really got deep enough into the reading. That's really mostly what the quizzes get used to used for. But we do have some creative people there, too, that have come up with some nice uses. Um, one of the things I do when I'm looking at a module and thinking, you know what, I'm just using it the same way all the time, is I go in and look at the features and say, you know, what are the features in here that I could use differently? Um, so one of the, some of the things that I looked at that we don't use is that the question bank can be shareable. Now, this takes a Moodle administrator to set this up because they have to set up a system role that allows the certain in instructors to share um, certain question banks, but it can be done. But if you, you have to have some patience because many of those uh, Moodle administrators are not teachers. And so when teachers come and ask them for things like that, they don't understand why it's worth the work to do what, they, what you're asking them to do. So just, just nicely keep after them, and they'll do it eventually. Um, but also, the questions are really easy to export and import. Uh, I like XML because it's what I'm used to, it's what I do. I know other people like GIF, uh, but it's really easy to import and export those questions out. Also, the thing that I hadn't thought about was how many retakes Unlimited could be. You know, that's something that we could really work with, and the, the different modes of feedback that are in there. Also, I've noticed a lot of people don't use all of the automated grading as much as they could, um, and they seem to want to go in there and manually grade a lot of things that they could do, have the system do for them. And downloading the responses onto a spreadsheet, I think that's awesome. There's, there's a lot of possibility there. <laughs> Good point, Tim. There's some students that will take that test 30 times if that's what it takes to get a, a hundred. You're absolutely right. Yes, Maureen, you can. Downloading those spreadsheets will help you evaluate those questions and see which are the ones that students had problems on. Also, there is an item analysis report in there, too, that you can use as well. But I like actually seeing the responses myself. Um, one thing before we start talking about the creativity, I, I've started suggesting to teachers at our school is to make quiz templates. Now that we can duplicate quizzes, I've asked them to go ahead and go in and make a template with no questions in it that has all of the settings for their after reading assignment, all of the set, and another one that has all the settings they like to use for the exam you know, and the different kinds of quizzes they like to take. That way, if they're wanting to duplicate, they're not duplicating a quiz accidentally that kids have already taken, and they changed the name on the wrong quiz. This happened to a few of our instructors, and that's made life a little crazy for them. Um, so I suggest that they make templates, hide them in their class, and then they can just copy them and move them where they need to, and then start adding questions. And they don't have to remember all those settings. Also, if they decide to change it, if they decide four chances is a little too much on the reading assignment quiz, students are just guessing they can change it to three in the template, and they don't have to remember for the next week to change that. Yep. OK, timing. Quizzes. Quizzes can be timed, and that can help with instruction. Uh, one of the things is building speed of knowledge. This is another one, just like Tim said, that students will keep taking it. Um, 
they'll keep taking it to get better at it. There's that self-competition for some students is very much of a motivator. This was one, this teacher was actually working with students who were second language learners, and she wanted to make sure they really understood the vocabulary in her class. She knew that that's not going to make it guaranteed that they're going to use the language, but at least they knew what it meant. And she did find that it did help. She set up practice tests with unlimited tries, and then those were timed just like the regular test was going to be. So the students would set themselves a goal of how much time they wanted to use on that test and what grade they wanted to get. Then when they were ready, they went ahead and took the test. The nice thing about it, too, is she was able to watch the students in their trials and see if there were some students that weren't making very good progress and sit them down and talk to them and brainstorm with them for other ways that they could study for that and make it better. The quiz templates in the gradebook, that's a good question, Sam. Um, if, you put, if you put the grade that you like to use in there, yes, they will. But you can hide them in the gradebook, and then they, they won't really show up in the same way as something else will, um, as a regular quiz will. But if you do that, you have to make sure to change the settings on your, your user report so that it will average the grades without uh, in, without including those hidden grades in there. Good point. Uh, we also had a teacher in the elementary, when I was teaching in elementary, that um, had students that needed to work on their math facts. and. She so they quit counting on their fingers all the time, and she set up quizzes, time quizzes for them, and then they would see how much better they could get. It really worked out well, and the students, like I said, they became self-motivated about it. She didn't have to get talk to them a, a lot about it. Another thing that we've used it for before we got Kaltura on our site was timing video viewing uh, because we had teachers that asked, how can I tell if the students even watch the video or watch the whole thing? Of course, we can't tell if they turned it on and then got up and walked away, but uh, we put it into a quiz. We embedded it right in the quiz, and then the quiz results, as you see down here, I outlined it in red, tells you how long it took the student to take the test. So at least we know how long they were in the test. You have to have at least one question in there. So if you use only going to have one question, you might want to just put it in the question part of the question. If you're going to have more than that, you could put the embedded video into one of those description items instead and then have your questions below. And they can be as simple as how helpful was this to you. It doesn't have to be comprehension unless you want it to be. Another thing that a lot of our teachers like to use is rubrics. Uh, one of the questions that came up, one of the questions that came up was, how can I get students to self-evaluate on the rubric? I want them to do some of the evaluations. And we kicked it around for a while and came up with using a quiz for self-evaluation. So here's one that was group work. Uh, the students were actually doing this group over an extended period of time for four weeks. So we put the rubric right into the quiz questions. Uh, we had one for each category, and then we just put them into the quiz. Students took it four different times, and it was the average of the grades. They only got one grade. We, they didn't get four separate grades on this particular one, although you can set it up this that way too. Teacher liked it because it also gave them a chance to look and see if there was anything going on in the groups that they were missing as far as any kind of conflicts or anything like that. And um, the way that we did the questions, this is a little hard to see, but we put the, the category in the question, and then in each of the answers, we copied in the level descriptions on this one. And then we changed the grade to percentages according to how many points that level was supposed to be. So it worked out really, really well.
Now this is another one that was for a project that they had to do. And we actually put tables in the question so that it looked like the rubric that they were used to seeing. Um, the nice thing about that is we discovered that after we got this all set up, changed our column colors using, you know, highlighting the column and going into under cell properties and changing the colors, making it look nice. We put the numbers down here in the answers, and again, we set up percentages for those. We found out to change that, we didn't have to set those up or do anything else with those tables. All we did was hit the edit this question, went in to the editing page, changed the... Um, text in there, just copied and pasted it out of the rubric, and then saved it as another. And it made a whole new question with all of that formatting, and this was the easiest quiz I've ever set up. It was so nice. Um, but And then our, our rubric was right in there, and it had a little bit of fancy formatting, so it looked like the rubric that they were used to seeing in the class. I love that one. Um, Another thing is before the class begins, what, especially when you're teaching online, sometimes you want students to go in and do some things in the class or give a preset um, or pretest, sorry, <laughs> pretest, so that you know what kind of background information the students have. So you can set a quiz up to do those things. Um, this particular instructor, this is one of our instructors that in a couple of different classes, he set up quizzes that the students had to go in and take before class started the first day. Uh, and he emailed them and told them that they had to do this. The first way that he did it is he asked the students to go in and explore the test, or the, I'm sorry, explore course, and then come in and take the quiz. And he asked them questions like, have you read the syllabus? Have you explored the Moodle site? Did you find the news forum in the Moodle site? And he, they were very simple answers, like, yes, I have, no, I haven't. And then the next question would say, if you haven't found the news forum site, please exit this test and go find it in the class and then come back and finish your attempt. So he was leading them through the process of exploring the site in depth. The other way that he did it, the second way, is he set the quiz up with all of the information in the quiz itself. So even though he had a copy of his syllabus on the site itself, he also had all of that information in the quiz so the students could go through it. He even had some tutorials, little video tutorials, on how to find some of the different things in the course and how to do some posting in the course to make it really easy for them which really is delivering content, which brings us to, the, to something else here in a minute. Now, the problem is, is when you do that, what do you do with a student that's late registering or the student that has a viable excuse for not getting it done? Well, you can go into the user and group overrides. It's When you're in the quiz, it's over there in the administration block, and it just says group overrides, user overrides. And these are the things that you can reset. You can reset the dates the quiz are open, the time limit if you have students that have a reading problem and need more time for the test, how many attempts are allowed. So if you need to give that student a second attempt, you can do it right here very quickly, very easily, and not make the settings change for anybody else in the class. Really, really nice if you're like me and when I was teaching and had a basketball team in my class. I swear everybody on it was in that class. And, um, you know, they would they would all miss this quiz. Well, if I had this, I could have just set it up for them to take the quiz before they left on the game, for the game. But no, I'm not, I'm not that mean. I, I would have set some of them up for after the quiz, but still. Um, you can also use that information if you do that pretest for placing students in additional content. If you use activity completion and restricted access, certain grade ranges on that pretest can slide the students right into either review content or new content. And if they need to review, if you set it up right, the other students in the class won't get confused because they won't even know that that content is there. 
the only ones who will see it are those who need it. I think that is so awesome. Another thing it can do like that quiz that was the syllabus and everything is content delivery. Now, don't say I'm saying we're going to replace the lesson with a quiz. I'm not saying that. Lessons have some awesome abilities that a quiz will never have, but uh, in the forum we had an instructor that said, you know what, I want my students to see all those questions every time they go in, They want I want them to go back and see to get previous attempts, I want to be able to grade those essays easier, and it was suggested that he use the quiz instead. So this was an awesome idea for me. I hadn't really thought about using a quiz as content delivery. This is one of the questions from that syllabus test. Okay, so he has all of this information in the question, in the little question down here, and here's the answers. Okay. There's features in the quiz that can make it a lot more interactive than what we usually do. Now, if you guys are using these things, wow, more power to you. Please share with us. We'd like to see those things. Um, if you're not, just let me know some of the things that you learn how to do. Please, I'm always looking for creative ideas. I collect things. I'm a collector. That's because I was a, a teacher for so many years. I collect everything. Um, the question behavior is what you want to look at for this. In. Yes, we do. And I'd be glad to talk to you about that later, Frank. Um, we do use Respondus at our schools to download and upload uh, quizzes that are directly from the publishers and to make some of our own quizzes. Um, there's several different modes here. Adaptive mode, deferred feedback is the one a lot of teachers use. Immediate feedback where students get to check their answers right away. And another one called interactive with multiple tries. Um, the, the options here too, that this is what the feedback is that the students get, whether they're during the attempt, right after it, Later when the quiz is open or after the quiz is um, finished, those things we can really do a lot of creative giving feedback to students and helping them to get content as well. I'm going to have to hurry a little bit because I'm getting over time. I always do. Um, but the interactive mode has a button that you click and you can try again. But also this right here where it says each attempt builds on the last, if you say yes to that, it will let them complete the quiz over several attempts. If you were using this for content delivery, I think that that would be really important because the students could see what they'd answered before and go ahead and finish on the next attempt. The adaptive also lets them have multiple attempts and they can add hints such as this question, which is a fake question, but on the hints after they checked it, because it was only partially correct, there's a link that says click here if you need help. So now that so many windows in the quizzes have the editing text boxes instead of just a text entry, you can do some of the things that you do in other places. So we gave them a link out to another part of the course where that information was, but we set up the target instead of leaving it like it usually does in the same window, we put it in a new window so that they can go out, look at it, close that window, then they're back in the quiz without closing out their attempt and getting confused about where they're at. Another thing that we can do now too is add media. We talked about the the videos, but also we can add pictures, we can add audio clips, uh, the matching questions. I could add them in the question part, but I couldn't add any media in the answers. The multiple choice, I could add media in both places. So there's a lot of things that you can do to make that 
delivering content a part of a quiz if you want to try it out. Um, another thing that quizzes can do. Okay. Thanks, Gareth. Okay. I always have too much to say, and I've cut and cut and cut and cut. But this is another idea. Um, it's in the details. This is from Moodle Recipes. The trip organizers that have a bunch of students going on a trip use the quiz to, con to put together all the information that they needed, emergency contacts, what the choices were at the conference, do you want chicken or beef or vegetarian for the banquet on Thursday, health issues, anything information that they needed. Then they had it right there in Moodle, but also because it could be exported Um, it can be exported, then you can just do a little formatting to make it easier to read, print it out, and you've got it right there with you as well if you have to get those emergency numbers when you're not online. Another one is a, a class that had proctors for the tests, and this was just information that the students could submit to let the professor know that the test was taken, it was proctored. They had a form that they had to download and have the proctor sign and mail in. This way the professor knew to expect it, but also if it's turned up without the student's name on it, they could match it up to whoever it belonged to because the information was there. Another thing that's really helpful in keeping track of those details is that you can use it to, to track checklists of different kinds of things that you're doing. Um, it could be things in the class. It could be a big project that has several steps and you want to make sure the students don't skip the steps, this can be their way of being able to track where they're at and what they have left to do. Okay, more content available. If you want to, if you want to get some more ideas, um, you can go to Moodle.net. It has courses that can be downloaded. So you can download the backup of a course, put it on your Moodle site and go in and look at what people are doing. See what kind of things that they're using the quizzes and the databases and the other modules for. They also have courses you can be enrolled in. Now over here on the side, a lot of people don't realize that's there yet, where that big blue arrow is pointing, is a link out to a database that has those presets for uh, databases, quiz questions, SCORM packages, all kinds of things that you can go in and take a look at and download. This is where people are sharing content. Sometimes people don't want to share a whole entire class, but they do want to share some content. That great rubric quiz that you made or something else that you've done, you can share it there if you'd like. Um, we really encourage people to do that. I do because that has made a difference for me on how much I've learned about Moodle. And I hope that I will see some of your names there, that you've been sharing content. And are there any questions? Oh, that's a good website, too. Thank you, Tim. I'll have to copy that and add it to my list. Is there anybody that has any questions? Okay. Um, just remember that there's all that information out there in the Moodle course, too. And you are very welcome to download it, use it, pass it around, do whatever you want with it. Creative Commons in the best. And you are all very welcome. Thank you very much for attending. I appreciate you. Hi, Paul. It's Gareth. Thank you very much indeed for a very incredibly comprehensive presentation. An awful lot there. Appreciate Unfortunately, with the time constraints, I had to call a slight halt to it. But I mean, so much there, wonderful, wonderful stuff. I 
sure there's I mean there's a lot more to be said uh, everybody please you know th thank Paula uh, if you have any questions please put them in the chat or feel free to grab the microphone again yeah thank you very much indeed Paula you must have spent absolutely ages getting that together that's brilliant thank you